Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank thee that thou hast called us to be thy servants in thy war. In the age-old struggle between thy people, the army of thy Son, and the court of the justice, prepare us day by day, our Father, to be better soldiers in thy service, and grant us the joy of seeing thy victory accomplished in our day. Thy standard advanced, thy cause established in the hearts of the generations to come. Bless us as we study the things of this world in the perspective of thy word, and grant that we be drawn closer to thee and become more faithful servants of thee by means of this message. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Last week we analyzed the centrality in the 17th century and in the 18th century of France, especially the greatness of France under Louis XIV and his successors. We saw also something of the significance of the Enlightenment and its thinking as it laid the groundwork for a new world perspective, reviving the motifs that had been so powerful in the Renaissance, carrying them forward and making them more vocal. We saw, for example, that the man of the Enlightenment was an urban man, divorced from the soil, seeing things without the wholeness of context that a rural perspective would have given him. We saw also that the total hatred of Christianity was openly stated by these men. Moreover, they were militantly humanist. They were bent on tolerating any human practice other than the worship of God in Christ. They felt that the new priests of civilization should be the humanists, the philosophes. They took over the churches and began their dismantling and destruction. Moreover, homosexuality was a mark of being a member of the in-group with these people. They had made, we saw furthermore, as their great cultural hero, Cicero. As I pointed out, Cicero is again a hero in many quarters. They despise science and business as Puritan and Huguenot characteristics. And they felt that they had been given by destiny the duty to rule over the common people who were too stupid to be able to rule themselves and needed an elite group like themselves. Now, this movement, of course, was common to all of Europe. In some respects, it originated, as I indicated, in Britain, England in particular. It would be easy in dealing with the history of England from the early part of the 16th century into the 20th century to make England the villain of the peace. It would be just as easy and, in fact, easier to make England the center of the stage for the whole period. And I think this tells us why, in some respects, some of the most incredible aspects of Western history in that era took place in England. After all, that was where the action was. And where the center of the stage is, you'll see there also the greatest concentration of evil. That's where the action is. That's where the issues are going to be threshed out. And so in England, you had some tremendous forces at work. The Puritan regime was put down when... In 1660, 
Charles II came to the throne not too long after the death of Cromwell. With Charles II, the emphasis was on anything and everything goes except the old faith and morality. One of his own friends remarked of him that he had never said a foolish thing nor never done a wise one. He prided himself on being a wit. He was during the whole time of his rule, and this is a matter of record now, <clears throat> in the pay of Louis XIV. He was a secret Catholic. He worked against the interests of his own kingdom to further the cause of Louis XIV. And it was only that Parliament again and again overruled him that England was not made a virtual tool of Louis XIV. Jane, Charles II at least had the common sense not to go too far. This was not true of his brother and successor, James II, who lacked common sense, who began the bloody persecution of the Protestants in Scotland in particular, and then also in England, and therefore lost his kingdom in the glorious revolution of 1688. William and Mary were called to the throne. After William and Mary, there was a long era of weak, monarchs. And this, of course, was made to order for the aristocracy. They took over the kingdom, and from 1688 on, they wanted neither the people nor the church to be a problem to them. Some years ago, I made a lengthy study of the Church of England from its very beginning through the 30s. Someday I want to do some revision on the work and publish it. There was a period there when for 70 years no convocation of the Church of England was called. They did not want a church coming together to decide anything. They had only political bishops, men who rarely even saw their sees. The aristocracy wanted to rule, and rule they did. Under Queen Anne, then she dying childless, it went to the House of Hanover of Germany, and the Hanoverian monarchs took the throne of England, but they spent as much of their time in Germany at Hanover as possible. George I didn't even bother to speak English to learn it. George II knew it, but not any too well. Their contempt for England was very open. They were not interested in it. They allowed the aristocracy to rule, and it was not until the grandson of George II, George III, came to the throne that you had for a long, long period of almost 75 years or so, a truly popular monarch. George III was a very simple family man. He tried very earnestly to cultivate the middle-class virtues. In that respect, he did recognize the old Puritan backbone of the country. The common people loved him. The aristocracy despised him. They thought he was a staid, prosaic fool and his wife a frump. The tragedy, of course, of King George III was that the family did have a great deal of inbreeding, and as a result of this inbreeding, a particular ailment, porphyry, 
worked quite a havoc on him. Very few people realize that he was not only a monarch for 60 years, that's a long reign, but off and on and increasingly towards the last, totally insane. Later on, I'll show you a picture of him, quite tragic. You would think to see the picture that it was one of the old King Lear and his grief. But Napoleon rose to power and the Napoleonic Wars took place and Napoleon disappeared and the King of England never knew what was going on. He was out of his mind. The aristocracy ruled. And the general position of the aristocracy was an elitism, of course. But moreover, deism. A polite term, really, for unbelief. The deists technically had a god. Somebody had to start the whole thing. And then he was an absentee god who had nothing more to do with the universe. And therefore, there was nothing that mattered, no law, no morality. Man was making his own way in the world. The deists were very cynical about the Bible and Christianity. And as a result, their contempt began to filter down. They wrote their books, they expressed their opinions, but they felt that this is for the elite. For example, Anthony Collins, who wrote Priestcraft in Perfection, and another book, Discourses on Free Thinking, was once asked why, in view of his contempt for Christianity, he would insist on sending his servants to church. And his answer was that they may neither rob nor murder me. Voltaire gave a similar answer. But when you have the thinking people holding such opinions, and when they have captured the church and virtually gutted it, what are the people going to get when they go to church? The consequence was that within a generation, the people were like the leaders, without faith without morality. The figures on the consumption of liquor in the early part of the 18th century and the early 1700s in England are staggering. They are really almost beyond belief. In some streets of London, every fourth or fifth house was a bar. I'll show you later on a picture Hogarth painted from life, and over one basement bar room, the sign reads, drunk for one penny, dead drunk for two pennies, free straw, free straw to sleep it off on. We do have evidence from various writers of the day that other places, which were of a little better quality, would advertise clean straw. <clears throat> we know, for example, from Robert Walpole's own account, and he thought nothing of it. This was routine. That when he was a small boy, he was regularly made drunk by his father. And he himself reports that his father would say, Come, Robert, you shall drink twice while I drink once, for I will not permit the son in his sober senses to be a witness of the intoxication of his father. Now, the consequence of all of this was a decline of the will to live. A decline of the will to live. The mortality of people was frightening. People died like flies. You can say it was poor medicine, but it was poor medicine 50 and 100 years later. Not any different, no improvement, and people did not die the same way. And at the same time in America, the mortality rate was nowhere near the same. The mortality rate also was very high for children. 
Somehow this loss of the will to live communicated itself almost, you might think, with the mother's milk for the children. And there wasn't the same care. I'm going to read some of the London Bill of Mortality figures for the era because they're so startling. In 1730 to 1749, these are 20 year periods, 74.5% of all children died. That's three out of four. Then, at the end of that period, the evangelical revival began. Whitfield and Wesley and the various evangelicals within the Church of England. In 1750 to 69, in the next 20 years, when this movement was beginning, the mortality was 63%. It dropped Eleven and a half points. In the next twenty years, seventeen seventy to eighty nine, fifty one point five percent. Then seventeen ninety to eighteen oh nine, forty one point three, and eighteen ten to twenty nine, thirty one point eight percent mortality. Now, of course, from our modern point of view, that's a high rate. But the significant fact is that without any real medical progress in those years, the evangelical reawakening and its growing impact on the population made for this much difference in the mortality. It was a time of considerable brutality in sports. In morality, in fact, is called a sport of the period. I'd like to read something from the work of Dr. Brady. Just a page or two, I could select much more frightful passages, but just to give you something of the picture. I quote, Even immorality under the cloak of the nature worship and natural expression propounded by deism was, during most decades of the century, largely winked at a sport. George II, Walpole, and the Prince of Wales were but representatives of a large section of high society who lived in flagrant, shameless adultery. Lady Montague, in October 1723, writing to the Countess of Mar, declared that in society the appellation of rake is as genteel in a woman as in a man of quality. The Drury Lane district of West London was an extensive seraglio on such terms as Drury Lane Vestals, Covent Garden, Virgin, and Newgate Saint were ironical designations of different classes of prostitutes. The court masquerades, moreover, which continued till the Lisbon earthquake of 1755, when the moral and religious feelings of the country procured their suppression, were scandal scandalously sensual while the popular subscription receptions and masquerades were copiously tarred with the same brush. Champagne, dice, music, or your neighbor's spouse were among the contending attractions, that's a literal quote, that expression, of the midnight orgy and the mazy dance. Horace Walpole, writing to Mann, May 3rd, 1749, concerning a subscription masquerade at which George II was present, said that Miss Chudley, a popular maid of honor, masquerading as if Iphigenia was so naked that you would have taken her for Andromeda, who rose naked out of the sea. And Vaisant, lumping together the masquerades of the time, describes them as scenes of dis uh, dissipation. Yet as late as February 1770, the House of Commons adjourned to attend a subscription masquerade held in Soho. Among the illiterate and outcast multitude, to such a pitch of barbarity did sensuality rise that frequently it was seen on parade. Every new parliament, for example, the borough of Garrett, a settlement of straggling cottages near Wandsworth, held a mock election, and the qualification of a voter was that he had enjoyed a woman in the open air in that district. The occasion, with all its obscene humor and bawdry horseplay, drew swarming crowds of debauchees from London. And so much custom resulted to the local publicans that they found it to their interest to contribute largely to the expense of the ceremony. So utterly depraved, too, were some rural areas that laborers actually sold their wives by auction in the cattle market. 
and baptism registers show how rampant was immorality in the villages. Moreover, because the lords were ruling with a radical hatred of the middle class, the productive, the merchant class, they were, of course, not contributing anything to the development of society and to the progress of that particular element that could create work, the producing element, the middle class merchants. The result was that their answer to the situation where so many of the lower classes were desperately poor, had to rob to eat, was to pass more and more severe laws. This is in a fact that is familiar to most people, how people were hung for next to nothing in those days. There were 160 offenses for which you could be hung. They were things like to pick a pocket for more than a shilling, to grab food and run, to grab goods and run, shoplifting, five shillings value, to steal fruit, to snare a rabbit as a poacher on a man's estate, and so on. Charles Wesley, on one occasion, preached in a jail to 52 persons waiting hanging, one of whom was a child of ten. The ruling class at this time was made up of men of the worst caliber, lords and aristocrats, who organized an organization, a secret society and club, called the Hellfire Club. It was an organization given to the systematic destruction of every kind of moral standard, practiced deliberately, including incest. The Hellfire Club was bitterly hostile to the colonies, to America, and to William Pitt, the great English statesman who was the champion of America. One of the members of the Hellfire Club, John Wilkes, supported America and many American communities in a county or two was named after him, but we have the right to question his integrity in this support because he was urging them not to fight. He was telling the American colonies, I am with you. Just leave it to me and I can handle the king and the king's friends. Now, spell king's friends with capital letters. Who are the king's friends? They were the ruling clique, the Hellfire Club. Thus, this Hellfire Club and their associates were very much like the philosophes of France. <coughs> but, all the while that this was going on, there was another force building up from the ground up, the evangelical movement both in and out of the Church of England, under Whitfield, under Wesley, under Berridge, and Fletcher in the Church of England, and many, many others. Its impact was tremendous. It began to revive a great deal of the old Puritan spirit. There are many who criticize it savagely, many historians. They point out how what killjoys they were and how much against uh, many things that the people loved they were and what strict Sabbatarians they were. Well, uh, they were all of those things, perhaps, and yet one of the things that led to trouble very early was their insistence on closing everything down on the Sabbath. And you can go to some of these historians and find perfectly horrible accounts of how repressive these evangelicals were, but they do not give you the other side of it. It was the practice of people in those days to pay off workers and servants on Sunday, when the only things that were open were the bars. Moreover, they would make an appointment in a bar to pay them off. 
You can imagine the consequences of that. Especially if the Lord or uh, a gentleman paying them off set up a drink to start things off for everybody. They were going to spend all the money there, which is what most of them did. And this is why the evangelicals both struck hard at Sabbath laws and anti-liquor legislation. This led ultimately to the prohibition movement throughout the world, which was a misguided movement. But very few people now realize that the prohibition movement was also a movement very closely connected with Marxism and with the various socialist movements. Right through the 20s, uh, the Soviet Union was very strongly prohibitionist. Why? Because for a couple of centuries, liquor and bars had meant the deliberate ex exploitation of the workers, very often by people who owned the bars and made sure the workman spent his money there and remained forever in debt to them, borrowing money from them. So you can understand something of the picture that faced the evangelicals. So they hit at these two points. They may have been misguided in their extremes sometimes, but basically they were dealing with a very real problem. The evangelical movement thus began to work from the ground up and it began to make a tremendous impact on the country as it progressively reached more and more of the people. Meanwhile, a book had been written in 1776 that also had an impact, Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, a classic statement of free enterprise economics. As a result, by 1838 to 41, a free trade movement was underway in England in strength. Sir Robert Peel, when he became Prime Minister in 1841 through 1846, favored it, and he reduced the tariffs drastically in 1842. With an immediate increase of prosperity. Peel was very savagely attacked for this again and again in Parliament by the Lords. He was also an attacked by one of the most brilliant men who ever was in Parliament in England, Benjamin Disraeli. Disraeli was very much a champion of the Lords and of the aristocrats. Disraeli was a man who was, to the core, a champion of the empire, of tradition, of the high church establishment, not necessarily because of any faith, and of the crown. And he was militantly against Sir Robert Peel. Peel, however, was able to prove that every time the tariffs were decreased, there was an increase of business and employment. He went to Parliament with a cold, hard facts, and he said, true enough, when we lower the tariff, it's going to hurt someone in a particular industry, in a particular line of work or of agriculture but it is going to help the consumers who are everybody, and it will ultimately help the nation as a whole. It will eliminate the businesses that need to be eliminated, and it will give new opportunity as foreigners selling their goods to us have pounds sterling to buy our goods. He made his case. He was, in spite of the fact that Disraeli could make him look like a monkey, because Disraeli was one of the most brilliant debaters Parliament has ever known, a man of tremendous wit and intelligence, who could have your own friends laughing at you. In spite of that, Sir Robert Peel went there repeatedly with a hard, cold facts. 
employment increased and business increased every time the tariffs were lowered. And to the degree they were lowered, to that degree there was an improvement. The Lords, however, fought back bitterly the aristocracy. And one of the things they did was to launch a series of investigations of conditions in industry. Now, you hear a great deal of horrible accounts of how terrible things were in the mines and in the factories in England with the Industrial Revolution. These reports are, in a sense, true, but in a much more important sense, they are a fraud, a total fraud. The Lords produced them, and the man who was the greatest in his use of them was Karl Marx. And it's interesting that the Lords and Marx and the Socialists together united against the manufacturers, the merchants. Now, let me illustrate why these accounts were a fraud. First of all, let us assume that we are an investigating committee investigating aerospace in Los Angeles. Now, we are out to do them in. We hate them with a passion. So what do we do? We go into a plant and we look for every instance of dirt. Here is a supervisor in a department who is seducing as many of the girls as he can and in fact telling them, if you want this job or if you want a promotion, you come across. You get the picture. There isn't any kind of sizable industry or business operating where you cannot go in and find enough dirt if that's what you're interested in. In fact, if you want to find fault with any one of us in this room, you can, because none of us are perfect. But that isn't a true picture, you see. Now, there were instances of mines that were terrible, some frightening reports of girls of nine and ten crawling through a shaft on hands and knees, the shaft no more than this, dragging a cart of coal. True, there were mines like that, but that isn't the whole picture, you see. If you're looking for the worst examples, you can always find them. If you want to prove that every mechanic is a bum, a cheat, you can go through Los Angeles and find enough mechanics who to change a spark plug will bill you for anything they figure that uh, they can make you a sucker for to say that mechanics are a fraud. You can prove that the clergy are all fraud, which may not be uh, too far wrong. <laughs> you, can, you can make a case for almost anything, you see. And this is exactly what those investigations were intended to do. A few years ago, a group of scholars from America, from South Africa, and from England did a re-examination of these reports that were issued at that time. And they conclusively demonstrated that they were not representative of the reality. Now, every textbook was carrying those horror stories before that book came out in the 50s. They're still carrying the horror stories because they're not interested in a good case for capitalism. However, as a result of this type of thing, the free trade movement plus the evangelical impulse, within ten years after they cut the tariffs, they had abolished welfare. 
That's the impact. Now, a lot of people lost money in the process. But the country as a whole gained. And it embarked England on its greatest period of power and prosperity. The Victorian era. The Victorian era was an evangelical triumph. Ironically, Victoria herself belonged to the opposition. She was not a religious woman. She was very happy when Darwin's book came out because now she wouldn't have to believe a lot of those things in the Old Testament. She thought very highly of Disraeli and basically her entire sympathy was with the aristocracy and the lords. The important person in the palace then was the Prince Consort Albert, a very brilliant man, something of a genius, who organized the Great Exhibition of 1851, which was a pure and simple, a kind of a world's fair to demonstrate the importance of British industry. It was a tremendous success. Prince Albert saw where the leadership was, the leadership of the future. It was in the merchants, in the businessmen, in the manufacturers, and he strongly favored them. The work of Prince Albert in the history of Britain is a very, very important one. He was a great man, and he accomplished a great work. I indicated how unhappy the work of the Lords was, but I should make an exemption ex uh, or two because there were some Lords who were very great evangelicals. Lord Shaftesbury, for example, this book, Lord Shaftesbury and Social Industrial Progress, tells us how much Lord Shaftesbury accomplished in a number of area, areas. For example, the treatment of lunatics, the lodging house scandal, the health, sanitation, and recreation efforts, popular education, the ragged schools, the 10-hour bill, uh, anti-slavery, and a great many other things, including the opium traffic. Lord Shaftesbury is an evangelical among the lords, together with a handful of others in the House of Lords. We're very influential in furthering the evangelical revival and getting through a different perspective, a free enterprise perspective, through Parliament. The Industrial Revolution, of course, took place in Britain. It was the center of it. It was the center because it was the country with the Puritan background. It had also gained because of the revocation of Nantes, uh, the Edict of Nantes, many Huguenots, as did America and the Netherlands. And these men were the middle classes, the entrepreneurs of France. So it had the cream of two countries. And these were the men of science, these were the inventors, these were the manufacturers. The inventions that the Industrial Revolution produced were many, the flying shuttle, the spinning jenny, the water loom, the pottery and iron industries, canals were built and canal transportation, James Watt and the steam engine, the factory system, then the railroads, the growth of the merchant marine because of free trade, and England became the civilizer of the Western world and of the far colonies throughout all the world. The lords were hostile to all of this. There was a long tradition, by the way, the kind of thing I'm describing began before the Renaissance and the years before. Do you know that when... Uh, Movable type was first invented and the printing press appeared. It was fought by the lords of the day. And they considered it a mark of being a lower class to own a printed book. 
So it was many, many years before our Lord would consider a printed book as worth buying and wouldn't sneer and deride anyone who owned a printed book. The people who put over printing were the students. This was a chance to get books cheaply. Britain, through free trade, became a great exporter to all the world. But she was an exporter of more than goods. When you consider the empire that Britain had up until World War II, an empire going back to the 18th century, what you must realize is that Britain exported throughout all the world into its empire education. Stack up the colonies of any other country as against those of Britain. And you find that the British colonies had an amazingly high number of university graduates. And these men got their education at the expense of the British people. Britain was an exporter of science. Science was introduced into one country after another and financed so that scientific institutes and agencies were established throughout Asia and Africa and the Pacific, everywhere. She was a great exporter of health, of medicine, of hospitals, of roads, highways, everything. When people talk about colonialism as though the colonies were milked, they're talking nonsense, especially in the case of Britain, because Britain paid for it and the returns were meager by comparison. The horrors of colonialism apply to one situation in particular, the Congo, when it was under Leopold of Belgium, not under Belgium. But Leopold owned it outright for a time, and it was a, an era of tremendous and brutal treatment of the natives. Incidentally, up until Congo received its freedom, it had almost no university graduates, whereas other parts of Africa did have many, and the British so many that uh, the figures are really staggering. Also, Britain was an exporter of law and order. The only law that vast portions of Africa and Asia had came with the advent of the British colonial government. Consider for a moment. Do you realize there were only about six thousand Englishmen in all of India before they left, before they turned it over to the Indians and the Pakistanis. Only six thousand, and they were running that country very efficiently, better than it's been run since. That's good administration, and it certainly is not exploitation. 6,000 Englishmen. That was the colonial administration. The rest of the administration, the army officers and all, were the people of India. And this was the way it was throughout the empire. A handful of men, then utilizing native resources and developing them systematically, conscientiously, with the utmost concern for the welfare of the people they were ruling. It was one of the great achievements of civilization. On top of that, 